So, I'm here, as you probably know, I've usually talked about Windows Server or some Azure stuff. Today I'm going to talk about Windows Server 2019. Uh, first of all, good morning everyone. Good morning. Oh wow, that was pretty good. Usually I say, can you do it again? Because we can do better. But then, but that was really good. But still, can you do it again a little bit more? Good morning everyone. Good morning. Wow, that was the best one so far. Perfect. Uh, so, my name is Thomas Maurer. Uh, I work as a lead architect for a company called iGenetics. I'm focusing a lot about Windows Server, Hyper-V, and now in the last couple of years, obviously, a lot of uh, Azure and Azure Stack, uh, mostly about Microsoft technology. Right? Uh, I also travel around the world to uh, talk about those technologies, and uh, today I'm here um, to talk about Windows Server 2019. So, who tried to download Windows Server 2019? Who was successful? <laughs> Very good, okay. So, uh, as you may know, uh, Microsoft announced Windows Server 2019 back at Ignite. Uh, it was shortly available, but then they had some, uh, found out about some quality issues, so they pulled that, so today you cannot download it. Same with the Windows uh, November update as well. So, just so you know, um, Microsoft is looking for a new release date to release it again uh, to the public. Uh, if you're one of the lucky ones who have got the ISO, be careful. <laughs> there, is, there is still some stuff going on there. Okay, so first, before I start with the technology part, you probably know that I also love to teach a little bit about Switzerland, right, where I'm coming from. Very small country, not a lot of people know everything about it. Um, so I'm going to teach you a little bit about that. Um, and then we start with the technology part. So first of all, where is Switzerland on the map, right? Uh, I can tell you it's not there. <laughs> it's more down there, right? No, just in case. Um, this is basically what everyone thinks it looks like uh, when we look out the windows. Uh, this is, by the way, it's famous for chocolate. Who thinks the Swiss chocolate is the best in the world? Ask Belgium. Belgium. Wait, what the hell is going on with that room? Something is seriously wrong with that room. Who thinks Belgian chocolate is the best? What the hell? <laughs> At this point, you're all wrong. <laughs> okay. So we are also famous for cheese, watches, banks. Fun fact, there were more, a time where there were more banks than dentists in Switzerland. Uh, now we have more Starbucks coffee shops than banks. Um, this is Zurich, the largest city uh, of Switzerland. This is uh, Bern, the capital of Switzerland. <laughs> and this is a typical Swiss data center uh, with the cows in front of it. Uh, just to be sure that, like, I'm not sure if the cows are still there, but it's actually a real picture, it's not a fake or anything. Good, so something else I want to talk about. Is someone from Sweden here? Or Switzerland? Someone from Switzerland? Really? No one? Okay. So Switzerland and Sweden oftentimes is very confusing, especially for our friends in the US, right? Someone from the US here? Okay. So then, Look very closely to the next couple of minutes, okay? Those are mainly for you. So when Spotify, the Swedish company, went to the stock exchange, uh, Wall Street showed the Swiss flag. So <laughs> that was quite funny, right? So there's a lot of confusion about Switzerland and Sweden. Usually when I'm in the US and I, like, people ask me where I'm where are you from, I tell them Switzerland. Oh, Sweden, I always wanted to go there. Yeah, no, okay. Um, that's fine. So, for everyone, that's a different Sweden, Switzerland. I obviously know we're in Europe, so there's not a lot about that. But I also made some slides to actually explain the differences between Switzerland and Sweden. Right? So then you will see that it's different, totally a different country uh, than Sweden. So first of all, let's start. This is a typical Swedish woman, and this is a typical Swiss woman. You can see the difference, right? Huge. <laughs> This is Kutpular, one of the famous Swedish tradition food, right? You can also buy them in Ikea. Ikea. Uh, this is Haktachli, how we call it in Switzerland. Uh, completely different, right? This is also very famous in Switzerland. And then we have uh, Swedish politicians and Swiss politicians. <laughs> Do not look alike at all, right? Completely different type. And then we have the biggest or largest furniture store in uh, Sweden. This one is the largest in Switzerland. <laughs> and then last but not least, this is the Swe Swedish king. And then we have the Swiss king right now. <laughs> so with that, I hope you learned something about Switzerland and Sweden today. And that it's not the same thing. 
Uh, as always, you can always win some chocolate in my sessions, so just tweet e to the hashtag E2E and my Twitter handle to take a picture of uh, my session. Not of this slide, my boss should think I'm working, right? Just throw some technical slide in the background and whatever. Uh, but then the funniest picture or the funniest comment, you have the chance to win some of the best chocolate in the world. Yes, it's from Switzerland. Good. So let's talk a little bit about technology. And to set the mood a little bit for Windows Server 2019, I want to first make sure everyone explains what's going on with Windows Server uh, in the last couple of well, years, since, especially since the Windows Server 2016 release. Um, so there are two types of releases of Windows Server. There are the long-term servicing channel, or the LTSC, uh, was for, before it was called Windows uh, Long-Term Servicing Branch, but now they changed it to a C. Um, which is like Windows Server 2016, Windows Server 2019, and obviously 2012 R2 and things like that. So everything we basically know. Who has heard about the SEC releases, the semi-annual channel releases? Okay, a couple of hands. So the semi-annual ch um, channel releases, uh, as the name says, they're released twice a year, uh, and they're basically focusing on application innovation. Right. So they are focusing on you know, bring container uh, technology um, faster to the market. Um, before, I will show you a little bit the differences here, but before, especially in container world, so if there's so much stuff going on, waiting two or three years for a new operating system to arrive, it's not really an option, right? It's like, it takes too long. So that's where the semi-annual channel releases come from. Obviously, they do the same with Windows 10 and Office and all those stuff, right? So it's basically the same concept. So again, long-term LTSC releases, um, it's basically the main version of Windows Server. Uh, but then you have the SAC releases, again, to the go faster with features like containers and applications and stuff. Uh, if you have been to a session before, when Microsoft introduced the concept of SAC releases, they also said that storage spaces direct and software time networking and all that stuff will be in those releases. After a while they realized that's not going to work and they pulled all the storage spaces stuff, all the software defined data stuff, and stuff from the SAC releases. So there's only like, if you run containers or applications, this is the way to go. There's some more differences. So again, I told you Windows Server released two to three years and then you have the SAC releases twice a year. And one of the biggest uh, differences here is the support statement. So Windows Server, the, the LTSC releases, you get five plus five years plus extended support. And then with L uh, the SAC releases, you get 18 months of support, right? After that, you need to upgrade to a newer version uh, of the SAC releases or LTSC releases. Um, they changed that statement, I think, for Windows 10 and for, um, I think, Office. And uh, they did not do that, as far as I know, for the server part yet. Okay, so again, the big changes, uh, the big differences here, uh, support statements and workloads you want to run on, right? So how does that look like? Um, I'm a very visual guy, so this is my, my favorite slide on that topic. Um, we have 2012 and 2012 R2, which were LTSC releases, 5 plus 5 years support. We have Windows Server 2016 with uh, desktop experience and server core, which also were LTSC releases. And then we had the first kind of SAC releases, right, which was back then called Current Branch for Business, um, which NanoServer was part of it. Who remembers NanoServer? <laughs> and uh, you probably know that there were some guys in the industry saying, yeah, NanoServer, that's the future of Windows Server, right? Um, did someone really deploy NanoServer in production? Yeah. Uh, usually I ask that question a lot, and then I usually get no hands, and that's fine, right? But then there was one, at one conference, one guy, like he raised his hand and I could see the look on his face that someone heard, someone was telling him that this book is the future. Well, Nano Server, by the way, still exists. It just lives in a container image, right? It's just available as a container image. So it is kind of like the future. And then we had those set releases, which were actually called Windows Server version 1709, 1803, 1809, and so on. Again, with 18 months of support. We also got now, or we will get, um, the 19, oh, maybe possibly three, or whatever it will be. And in between that, we had also the Windows Server 2019 release, 
So we also have an LTC release there. Right? So this is basically the story uh, you have. Um, if you're not working with containers or the application innovation happening in Windows Server, you'll probably stick to the LTC releases. Right? This is probably the way to go, especially if you don't deploy Hyper-V, Storage Spaces Direct, and things like that. Good. So I talked. There is a lot of confusion around like, also code names and the version naming and what are you talking about. So I pulled this list a little Same bit. Here. So we had threshold one and threshold two, like which are code names for Windows 10 releases. And then with um, Redstone 1, basically, this was the code name for Windows uh, 10, the anniversary update, and also Windows Server uh, 2016. We then had a Redstone 2, which was only a Windows 10 release. And then we had it again, we had the SAC releases, uh, where also there were uh, of 3 and 4. And then we had the last RS5 release. This is basically the last Redstone release, which is Windows Server 2019, and also Windows Server version 1809, even though it's not released in September. Uh, you see also that there is like two X's, that means there is going to be a version like dot, like the pixels in there. <laughs> Good, so let's talk about Windows Server 2019 and uh, the changes which are coming to it, right? We have a ton of stuff. Uh, I will talk a little bit longer than on the agenda because I started later and we have some time because Thomas uh, Vogelgaard did not arrive here. So I will use that to show you a little bit more because we have really a ton of stuff and I'm trying to show you a little bit the things which are probably not that um, public or they don't get a lot of publicity. So first of all, um, a couple of you guys will say, okay, they talk about hybrid all the time, and uh, the understood Microsoft Azure, that's the thing where very good goes. Um, I will also show you, obviously, a lot of on-prem stuff. But it's really important to understand that Microsoft really understands that there is not just one cloud, right? There is not just one, like, one place to run your workloads. Um, they really understand now that people want to run their own workloads in their data centers as well, and they have reasons for that, and Microsoft offers now solutions and still, well, still offer solutions and invest in those solutions to run workloads on premise. Could be Azure Stack, could be Windows Server, there's a whole platform now uh, where you can invest. And if we talk about investments in Windows Server 2019, we basically can create four categories, right? We call, we call the first one hybrid, we then call it the hybrid conversion structure, which is basically all the software defined networking stuff. Uh, we, another one, security, and then application innovation. And I try to speak a lot about um, the application innovation stuff because I know a lot of you guys are interested in RDS and things like that, what's happening there. Um, so I will try to spend most of my time there and also in the hybrid and hyper uh, converge stuff. So let's start with hybrid. Um, one of the main things I realized when I started working with Azure, coming from the on-prem world, was how hard is it to basically connect stuff to Azure, right? How hard is it to migrate workloads? Does it really need to be that hard? And there are good solutions out there and things like that, but Microsoft realized that they need to make it easier. So they integrated uh, several stuff. So we get some hybrid integration, uh, which you probably have heard of, the Azure Network Adapter which is basically a very cool way of easily connect your server to an Azure network. I'll show you that in a second, when the internet works fine, and I can really demo that. Uh, we have Azure Site Recovery integration to do failovers to Azure. We have Azure Backup integration, um, Azure Update Management, which is basically one of the very cool technologies which only, does not only work with Azure, it also works with on-prem workloads. It's basically an update orchestration engine uh, where you put all the servers in, and then you can manage and orchestrate your updates on all your systems. And I saw that funny tweet where one guy said, I just automated my whole job for 400 bucks a month, and my boss, my boss doesn't know. And then the other thing, Azure file server integration, so you can replicate your file servers to Azure, and you can replicate all the file servers over the world. So if you have multiple file servers and branch offices, you can replicate those uh, between every, um, every branch office. So with that, we got our hybrid integration, and I want to show you a quick demo of that, uh, how that looks like. So this is my Windows Server 2019 <coughs> server uh, running on my notebook here, right? This is like a, a VM here on my notebook. 
Uh, I also use in Windows Admin Center. Who has seen and heard of Windows Admin Center? Awesome. Who likes Windows Admin Center? Perfect. Okay, so Windows Admin Center is basically the new way of managing your servers in a technical way. It meant to be replacing those local only tools which are, based, uh, which are used, for example, device manager and things like that, and a lot of other stuff. And now they added a lot of other features to it. And this is basically how it looks like when you just scroll into it. Um, you can see I have a web-based register editor, I have remote desktop, I have frozen features, and I can manage everything basically from, from, that, screen, uh, from that screen. And again, it's web-based, so you can access it with every client from anywhere. Um, doesn't really matter where. For the hybrid integration, the first thing I do, I go to settings, and you can see you have that little Azure button here. So what I did already is register my Windows Admin Center with Azure. So I can now, for example, connect it to create the logins from Azure AD, so everyone basically can do all the credentials and stuff and store the Azure AD if I want to. But I can also just use it um, to manage my system here and go on. So what I did, you can see that I have different things, and one of them is backup. So I connected it to Azure Backup, and I can manage all the Azure Backups directly from my Windows Admin Center. Right? I don't even need to go to the Azure portal or use something in Azure. Uh, everything is basically can be set up directly from Windows Admin Center. The next thing I want to show you is on the network. So if I go to the network tab, and I have opened it, uh, is here this Azure Network Adapter. So I added that Azure Network Adapter already, uh, and what allows me, what this allows me to do is I have here a VM running in Azure, and it has an internal IP address. I go to network. <coughs> you can see the internal IP address 10.1.0.4, and obviously because I'm not connected here. So, oh, case sensitive. Huh? So, if I do a ping, obviously that doesn't work, right? How would my my server here now connect to Azure? So, what I can do very simple is basically go to the network tab again, I click on that, and say connect. And this will open my connection to Azure, and now from that server, if everything works, I'm now connected to this Azure subnet and can access all the Azure resources in that virtual subnet on Azure, right, directly from that server. So if you have those small branch offices and things like that, where you don't have any, any large firewall appliances or VPN gateways or something to connect to that system, this makes it very simple to connect your server directly to the Azure network. And obviously I can do then things um, to access resources in Azure. So that's about the error part. Okay, so this was hybrid integration. I'm super excited about that because that makes it easy to pass. There's a question in the back. Yeah, before you move off of that, I was wondering how do you feel about the security of Windows Admin Center being kind of a new interface and all of that? Do you feel locked down enough? Um, so the question was uh, how I feel about the security of Windows Admin Center, um, about like if it's locked down enough. So Windows Admin Center today, um, I think the role-based access, there, are, there is some role-based access stuff in there. Um, I don't think it's sufficient yet for every large environment, right? Um, but I think for small environments with the right thing in place, it is, right? It's also not meant to replace, for example, System Center or something like that. That's not the case, right? Where you have those large workloads where you can really do like, basically everything on role-based access and you can really lock down things and have all these audit logs and things like that. Um, that's definitely the, the, the better option. But for a smaller environments or for some specific task, I think Windows Admin Center is good. They're still working on, though, on bringing more and more of those role-based access and more security into it. Yes, another question? Yeah, uh, we are doing a session on Windows Admin Center on Sunday at 10.50, so if you're interested, just join and we'll 
Perfect. Perfect. So if you want to see more about Greenland's Admin Center there, um, join that session on Sunday. Uh, I promise it's going to be very interesting because there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and another question? Yes, because uh, it's a research right now, so the server release is still open. So we gave the wrong server release and it's not general available. Right? Yeah, that's correct, yes. Uh, yeah, server release, again, as I said, yeah. Um, it's not, they released it quickly and then pulled it back, and it's still on board. Um, I, I hope that they bring it out probably this Friday, uh, but we'll see. Okay, let's switch to hyperconverged infrastructure. And hyperconverged infrastructure is really important for Microsoft and then If you're building today your environment, you probably come from those traditional setups with the SAN and hyper, hyper, um, hypervisor servers and you have all that fabric. And Bring that together, I mean this is not only Microsoft, there are also a ton of other vendors, I don't have to tell that in the room, right? Everyone knows about it. Hyperconverge is a really big topic and should make uh, the use of using commodity servers and commodity hardware and at the end you just use software to do all the stuff and the intelligence of the software to basically work on that. And Microsoft is working and highly investing into that infrastructure. Also, Azure Stack, by the way, leverages all that stuff which is in Windows Server, right? They are still on Windows Server 2016 right now, but they are using storage spaces and Hyper-V and hyperconverged infrastructure on Azure Stack or in Azure Stack. So, let me talk a little bit about a feature called System Insights. Does anyone know in the room know about System Insights, which is in Windows Server? Okay, one person? Yeah. Perfect. So this is a feature which is probably not one of the fanciest ones, but it's a very cool one. So what it allows you to do is it leverages those log files, those um, uh, resource meters, performance logs, and performance counters to basically do predictions of your environment, right? To figure out, okay, are, am I running out of uh, storage space? Am I running out of memory in the consumption in the future? And it does basically that kind of like in a machine learning way. Um, directly on your system. Right? This is not connected to Azure at all. This is really running on your box as well. So what we can do again, this is on your local box, and there are kind of like four things pre-baked in there. So volume consumption forecasting, storage consumption forecasting, uh, CPU and network forecasting. Right? Those are only the starting points. So those are the four Microsoft baked in. But you can think about that it could be very interesting also to um, detect errors, right? So if you're dealing, for example, with storage systems, uh, you probably all, everyone from here in the room who's dealing with storage systems knows about this. So if you have one disk going bad um, in a storage system, it can impact the whole um, storage, right? So for example, uh, if a disk just fails, that's fine, right? You can say, okay, that disk doesn't work anymore. What happens if the disk gets slower? If the latency of the disk gets up, right? Very hard to detect and very hard to know what's happening. With those tools, we could detect things like this, right? So let me quickly show you. I have some slides there uh, to show to show how it works, but I also could want to do a quick demo on that. So this is, again, Windows Admin Center, and you can see we have different volumes, and it shows that we have an alert there, because one of the volumes seems to go out of storage capacity in the future. So if I drill in, I can see that volume B here um, will soon hit a, a case where it's, there's not enough storage anymore. Right? And it takes that from the previous learning, what happens with that drive, how many files do I put them over time. Right? And then if I drill in more, uh, I can see that um, that when I'm running out, what's the what's the assumption? And the cool thing about it is, it does not just say, "Hey, by the way, you have a problem here." It also gives you suggestions. So if you look down here, you can see it tells you, "Okay, extend the volume." That's one of the options. Uh, use as a file so or do a disk cleanup of those files. Right? It gives you options and also tells you, "Okay, by the way, those are options you can do uh, to do that." So let me quickly show you how that looks like a little bit from the technical. <coughs> Switch back to my Windows Server here. And if I drill in to System Insights here, you can already see that I have those four uh, types um, which I can check for. Very important though, by the way, you can also extend it by yourself. You can create basically those rules 
uh, by yourself and then also bring some intelligence to it. So if you want to check for something and some for groups of forecasting, uh, this is an option. So if I drill in here, for example, for the CPU, it will load. And you will see that for me, everything is fine, right? It sees like the history and it will be okay for that system. Uh, that performance didn't go up that much, right? This could be very interesting if you have container hosts, if you have hypervisors, if you have storage, you know, sort of storage devices. All those servers where you have, like, over time, you get more and more load on it, uh, you can see what's happening and how long it takes um, and how long the performance is sufficient. Uh, I, again, as you can see, UI, in a UI way, uh, this is built into Windows Admin Center. So Windows Admin Center is really the way where this is going. Um, but you can also go and manage those, manage those things using PowerShell. And since I think the view is really, really small, go even one more up. So what I can do, I have already installed insights. Uh, and then if I check for commandlets, I can see that there are several commandlets for that feature. If I then run get inside capabilities, I see those four again, same thing, nothing really new. And if I then have a look at the CPU one, it tells me that, okay, by the way, you seem to be okay, uh, there's enough CPU performance for you in the future, right? So you can also integrate that in any other monitoring tool or platform uh, to see what's going on. And important again, this is all stored and done locally on your server. Right, there's nothing going to a cloud platform or anything uh, to leverage that. Okay. So this was System Insight. Now let's talk about a little bit about Windows Server Storage. Again, we don't have too much time, but we'll go really, really quickly. Um, but there's an insane amount of things happening in the storage space. So, for example, the Windows Admin integration, you could see that, you probably will see a little bit of that. Um, uh, on Sunday, and then we've now got dedupplication for RDFS for the resilient file system. So this is a big point here. And then, um, where, who in the room runs storage spaces direct? Okay, who uses like the mirror volumes, the three-way mirror volumes? Some are using parity. Or okay, so you're going to be very happy for the parity part. Um, so for the others explaining that, so in the storage part you have two options for volumes, or maybe more, but two real options that you can store VMs on. The first one is the mirror option, the three-way mirror. This is absolutely the fastest option, right? You have three copies of data. The problem with that is that you also has own, have only an efficiency uh, of 33%, right? So you lose 66% uh, of your storage based on that. Now there's something else called mirror accelerated parity, which is parity plus a little bit of mirror. And um, um, for that part, think about it as a RAID 6 with some caching and things like that. Uh, this is really not accurate, right? But uh, for those who are not familiar with it, think about something like this. The problem with that was that performance was really not that good, right? So if you want to go for high performance, uh, mirror is the best option. But now with Windows Server 2019, they pumped up the performance, like it's now twice as much as it was before in Windows Server 2016, right? So the mirror accelerated parity really becomes an option uh, to store your virtual machines on. Uh, with that, you gain better performance and better efficiency and lower costs, obviously. <coughs> then the other thing is storage class memory. Who has, who knows what storage class memory is in that room? Okay, one person. Uh, who has a persistent memory? Okay, a couple of marks. So, what Microsoft did is, this is basically persistent, our storage class memory is basically a memory dim, which is persistent, right? So, you get the speed, all the speed advantages from memory, um, from RAM, but you also get the concern to store things on it, right? You can, you can think about that this is insane performance. It also is insanely expensive. So, if someone in the room here has storage class memory somewhere, I really want to try it out. So, so. Um, so this is really important. And there are two things to it. So they integrate that in obviously in storage spaces direct. But if you're running Hyper-V, you're also able to directly attach storage class memory to a virtual machine. In that case, if you have a high performance SQL server running a virtual machine, um, you can store the database, for example, directly on that memory part, right? 
So you get an insane speed inside virtual machines, an insane storage speed inside virtual machines. Uh, we also get cluster sets, so if you're running multiple large clusters and you want to put them together in a single identity, that's cluster sets. You can put them together. So we have one customer who was running, I think, was 32 uh, hyper-converged clusters. They could manage that and put that in one large cluster set and then manage it from there. And then obviously they worked a lot on scale and we're going to have a quick look at that uh, on type of scale. So they worked on um, the scale numbers for um, storage space is direct. You can now store up to four petabytes of storage. Um, obviously get more performance. The volume size got up to 64 terabytes. Right. This is basically what happened. So they, they get that larger scale in terms of that. It's still 16 nodes and it's still about the same amount of drives per cluster. So with Windows 2016, I'm showing off a little bit now, or Microsoft did show off um, a little bit, they got like 6.6 .6 million items out of the system, right? With Windows 2016, 16 nodes, and this was still very industry leading record number. And with Windows 2019, they showed now at Ignite that they can do even better. With 12 nodes this time, they got like to 13.7 million items, right? It's crazy. It's like, that's what people love about storage spaces, is the performance you get out of it. Obviously, you need the right hardware to deliver, right? There's always only that much performance you get out of hardware. But now, with Windows Server 2019, um, and the right hardware configuration, you can get insane amounts of performance in a single cluster. The same thing they did, they have now the largest systems um, for storage spaces direct, with 3.6 terabytes. And again, software-wise, they would support up to 4 petabytes of storage in a single rack. However, I've talked now a lot about storage spaces being great for the high performance net, high performance solutions, um, or like large large storage where you need a large one. But it's also very interesting for small environments, right? So where we have the two node clusters. So one of the big problems we had with Windows Server 2016, if you have a two node cluster, one node failed, and another drive failed in the other node which was still running, your data is basically gone. Right. That was a huge problem for small environments. So now they have a new functionality um, where it's able to have okay, a loss of a complete node in the two node system and also a drive failure in the other system and the data is still there. So you can build very cheap solutions for the small offices, brand offices or small customers uh, for a very cheap price. Then we got a lot of software to define networking improvements. I want to really quickly through that because I am handle that if someone has deployed STN with Windows Server. Right. So they are very cool features. They bring basically Azure technology uh, back to Windows Server and uh, do encryption of subnets and things like that. The biggest one here, I think, is the uh, dual stack support. You can now use STN with IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. Before you had to basically choose which one you wanted. So if you wanted to have a virtual network with IPv4, uh, or uh, you could not run IPv6 on the same virtual network. Good. So let's talk about security. This one, I only want to highlight one feature because we don't have time to talk about it that much. But uh, trust me, I could talk for days about security in Windows Server. Um, so one thing which is coming is Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection. So you can now turn servers to that service, which is hosted in, in Microsoft World, and it helps you basically detect threats uh, which are happening, really deep down kernel attacks and things like that, um, which is very simple to use. Uh, and it, I think we have some experts here that use probably Windows 10 before. You can also now join your Windows service. Right. Good. So let's go to application innovation. That's where we're going to spend some time. So first of all, uh, there's now in-place upgrade support for Windows Server 2019. That's usually where people start to clap and there's applause for yeah. that. <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> in, in my very, very neutral lab environment, it worked perfectly. Flawless. I can't like that one. So it would take too long. <laughs> So again, it's supported, but it's only supported for Windows Server 2016 and Windows Server 2012 R2, right? If you're running Windows 2008 and Windows 2008 R2, which are basically going out of support very soon, this is not going to help you there a lot, right? But still, and this, to be honest, this is a huge one. 
And there's a lot of investment into that to do that. Um, uh, but it, for us, it seems to be a small thing. But uh, in place upgrade to servers, uh, it's fine. I mean, there's probably not everyone is going to update it like this or do an in place upgrade. Um, there's still the option of redeployment and things like that, obviously, which in, in, a, lot, in, a, lot, in a lot of cases makes sense. But to be honest, everyone has that like couple of servers which some guy years ago did the setup and did no installation documentation on it. And there are no installation files anymore, there's nothing going on, um, so this could help to upgrade you to a new version. The other thing which happening is in container space. So this is a huge investment, and this is not stuff just released in Windows Server 2019. This also came with the SAC releases I mentioned before. So they're working on new container images, and they came down, they're reducing the size. So if you look at, for example, Nano Server, uh, you can see that we have a Nano Server image here, uh, which was one gigabyte in size. This was basically the Windows Server 2016 Nano Server container image. Uh, if you look at it now, it's around 200 megabytes. It even goes more down. I can show you that. Um, so we did a huge effort here to take out stuff and, and make it smaller and faster, um, and, and, and also for the other container images. We also have now the Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows Server. Who is familiar with Windows subsystem for Linux? A couple of hands. So this allows you basically to run a Linux shell on your Windows device, right? This is in Windows 10, you can download that from the Windows Store, but you can also deploy it now on your Windows Server, and I'm gonna show you that. And isn't that crazy? Who was there in the, in the era of Windows Server 2000, 2003, where Linux was cancer, right? Um, if you look at this, this is really awesome, what we see here. And then Microsoft is also supporting some Linux tools, so you have tar, curl, OpenSSH, hard by OpenSSH, those are now ported to Windows Server and Windows 10 as well. Uh, very interesting, you can now, for example, do an SSH connection from your Windows device to a Linux server, and from there you can connect using SSH to your Windows server, and all that way around, and you can use SSH, different SSH tooling, or you can even use PowerShell to do now PowerShell remoting over SSH, right? Pretty awesome. So again, this is an additional feature, you haven't seen it, you can leverage that in Windows 10. You have OpenSSH client as well as server, and on server, you, again, you can also install it using PowerShell uh, to do that. And then you basically get the SSH client on it. You have an SSH server. Yes, exactly, yes. You also have SSH server. Good. Uh, then there are some high improvements. A lot of them are focusing on, on developers, right? So for example, the VM sharing experience, so you can easily export the VM and give it to someone else. There's built-in net switch, which is perfectly awesome if you run VMs on your device here, right? So when you're running um, VMs on your notebook and you switch to another VLA, uh, wireless network or something, uh, this helps you there. And also very helpful in the container world. Automation checkpoint creation and some online templating. And I will talk about, about that in a second. Uh, there's also a new Hyper-V or NV UI, <coughs> just to make it a little bit more simple, right? So if you boot now, the virtual machine shows up like this. And then let me quickly show you those things. So now I have a couple of demos, and to be honest, I have to check that I don't forget anything. So first of all, let's have a look quickly at. at Docker here, at my container images. So first thing I want to highlight, which I didn't mention before, you can now run Linux containers on Windows and on Windows Server, right? So you can run Windows containers and Linux containers side by side in your environment. And then the other thing I want to highlight is the different sizes. So you can see now if I look at the latest sizes here, let me zoom in quickly. So if you have here Windows Insider, Windows Server, Core Insider, and Nano Server Insider, you can see the sizes are now down from almost, in some cases, from almost 10 gigabytes down to like three gigabytes in size in case of Windows Server Core. Um, what I also want to highlight, which I didn't talk about, is you can see there are now three container images. There's Nano Server, the Server Core one, and there's a new one called the Windows Container Image. Did, does someone know about the Windows container image? Okay. So the Windows container image, so for Windows Server container image, is basically based on Windows Server. 
But however, there are a lot of applications which just do not run on Windows, uh, on Windows Server Core. So in that case, they created a container which is even larger, but has more DLLs, more APIs, and all that stuff in there. So it, it allows more application to run inside a Windows container. That's one thing I want to show. And if I switch quickly to my server here. So what I did here, I downloaded the um, Windows subsystem for Linux for Ubuntu, for the Ubuntu version. If I go in here, you can see how that is built. You can see I have an Ubuntu exe here. And if I run that, you can see I'm running now Ubuntu on my Windows server. And it allows me to use all the, oh. Uh, I prepared myself. <laughs> Just had a typo, I think. So you can see that I'm running now Ubuntu uh, directly on my Windows server. And you can leverage all of those tooling and sets in there. I can basically go and install uh, Ubuntu software or things which are running on Ubuntu. Right. <laughs> Good. Oh, and one thing. Who used the uh, Hyper-V Quick Create? This is now also... Who saw that button here, the Quick Create button? Who saw that before? Okay, that's now in the Hyper-V Manager. And what happens, it gives you a VM gallery uh, from Microsoft with different images. So we have, for example, the Windows 10 dev environment, which is basically a VM installed with Visual Studio Code and things like that. You just click on it, it will download it, and you have the VM running Windows 10 with the latest and greatest dev environment. And then they also added Ubuntu with all the Hyper-V tooling installed. So basically you can just download and create an Ubuntu VM very, very fast. You just click on it and create virtual machine, and that's it. And you can also create your own images. So if you have a company where you have, for example, developers which are using different virtual machines and you want to give them the option of creating their own image or have their own image running on their own notebooks and workstations, you can also create them an image library for them. And they can basically just download the images out of that library. Good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about RDS. Um, I was hoping that there is a full-time RDS session. I think there is something uh, on Saturday with Jim, I think, and he does some talks on, on that, but they're probably not focusing directly on all of the RDS stuff. So first of all, RDS, and why does it matter? RDS is huge on Azure. It has a huge growth rate. And they mentioned that RDS on Azure is about 10% of the Azure compute. <coughs> so what the um, VM they run on Azure, about 10% is that. So that's a huge amount, especially if you think about that 50% of the VMs running now on Azure are Linux VMs, right? So that's, that's a big number here. Good, and then you probably also heard, this is not built into Windows Server, but you probably heard about Windows Virtual Desktop, right? So Windows Virtual Desktop is a virtual desktop service hosted in Microsoft Azure. Um, and it gives you basically just like virtual desktop as a service. What you do is, you still manage the clients, you still manage your um, session host, if you will, but Microsoft manages the virtual desktop infrastructure services, so they basically do that as a service. And it's based, and that's really interesting, it's not based on the server, it's based on Windows 10 Enterprise Multi-Session. <coughs> so you can, I think you cannot download that yet, it's just like, you really, you can only use it with Azure, but uh, maybe it will also come there. And it gives you a real that the there makes it, like Edge is working and all the, the store stuff is working as well. So this is Windows Virtual Desktop. But then of course you have RDS and how do they compare now? So virtual desktop is ideal if you want to manage like if you want to manage platform. So Microsoft is taking care of the whole platform. Um, if you want to use the Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session, right? Notes, whatever. Uh, whoever came up with that name, sorry. And then you can also run Office 365 Pro Plus on those nodes, right? 
If you compare that, for example, to uh, the RDS servers, there you need to run Office 2016 or Office uh, 2019 today. And then RDS 2019, um, if you want to do the whole environment, if you want to take care, if you build it on-premise, if it's not running in the cloud, if it's not running uh, on Azure, uh, this is where RDS comes in. Everywhere where you already run, have existing systems uh, to basically upgrade them to a newer version or um, to basically extend current deployments. So when we look at, there are some things going on with uh, remote FX and the, um, the graphics part as well. Uh, we have Windows Server 2012 R2, which had this remote FX eGPU thing. Uh, it was also extended a little bit in Windows Server 2016, but they also added discrete device assignment, so DDA, which basically allows you to keep the native network card directly in the virtual machine and, and leverage the, the graphics power of that virtual machine. And this is what they basically extended in Windows Server 2019, so they deprecated remote FX eGPU in Windows Server 2019 for RDS, right? So they are saying, okay, um, we're basically doing DDA uh, for the virtualization part if you start in the future. If you have existing ones, it will still upgrade, right? It will still upgrade, uh, but if you do a new installation, uh, you will not be able to remote use remote effects vGPU uh, in there. And the other very interesting part is when they, when they, they talked a little bit about using um, uh, GPUP or GPU partitioning, uh, this is something they are looking at it, and to be honest, my hope was that it was in Windows Server 2019, uh, but they did not release it uh, as of today. But I know that they are investigating into it and see what they can uh, achieve your partition, which then will allow you to use one large network card and split it for multiple virtual machines, right? But this is what's happening in there. There are also some improvements to the RDS uh, protocol for um, like 4K resolution and things like that to make that more smooth. Good, so this is my last technical thing I want to talk, is the Windows feature on demand. And what it happens, so Microsoft is really pushing Windows Server Core, right? Uh, so it's all about Windows Server Core and making that a good tool. One step was bringing Windows Admin Center, which allows you to manage server cores as well. But still, you have some core servers where you need to have some local only tools, right? So with this feature on demand, you're basically able to add features and stuff to it. So for example, you can add those local tools, device manager and things like that to um, uh, your server core. And the cool thing about, well, I'm not sure if it's really cool, but uh, you can also add Internet Explorer to your server core. <laughs> so don't do that, by the way, if you don't need it. But the scenario for this could be, if you have that single server standing somewhere in this physical box, you want to install Windows Server Core, um, but you have, for example, a RAID controller which you're using a web-based UI uh, to manage the RAID, uh, you could not do that with Windows Server Core, right? So this may be giving you an option to still use Windows Server Core, but have it Explorer explore on it, for example. Yes? Isn't this feature a little bit isolated, so it's not trashing the general installation of your server core? Yes, so this is, this is again, yes, absolutely. So this is, uh, as, as it says, it's a feature on demand, so if you install Windows Server Core, you're not able to use that. You will need to add that using this and to basically add the functionality you need. Right? The plan is not to just have it in there, the plan is really to just add it if you need it, if there is a reason uh, for you to have it. Does that and so the point out is it's isolated from the server core, it's not trashing you with all the, I don't know, oh, the yeah. DLLs and so yeah. on, they are not staying anymore on the server core. Yes. When you remove it, it's removed. It's not yes, like absolutely. Yeah, it's like exactly. a container, sort of container. Yeah. It's <laughs> split it up in, in different things, yes, absolutely. So and the other thing, which is really big, is the end of life uh, of 2008 and 2008 R2, right? So probably you all know, you're probably all running still servers like this, or our customers are still running 2008 and 2008 R2 servers. So you have two options, and this is pretty cool, to be honest. Uh, if you're, especially if you're an Azure consultant, this now becomes really cool. So one of the options now is to put your Windows Server 2008 and 2008 R2 machines on Azure, and you will get for free additional uh, few years extended security support for your Windows servers, if they run on Azure. The second one is you just stay on prem with those and you pay for it. Right? So that's what that's basically the options you have, except for obviously upgrading to a newer operating system. But this is really important 
Um, so if you run that in Azure, um, you basically save you a lot of money, right? But if you move it to Azure, don't you pay more than running it internally? Technically, it's <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm just talking about the licensing part. License. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, of course, you have all the costs then, and we all know that cloud is not cheap, right? And things like that. Absolutely. Cloud is not the strategy. Cloud is not the strategy, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then one last thing uh, System Center 2019. There will be a System Center 2019, so System Center is not that, right? Uh, it will be released in the first half of 2019 and it will bring support for Server 2019 uh, and also integrations into Azure and some multiple stuff which they should have done for years, they are finally doing that. So this is also pretty healthy. So if you have customers running System Center, there will be the next version uh, or the next major version of System Center as well. Good, so with that, um, I want to thank you all and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thank you.